magazine was one of my favorite magazines in the 1990s. It was a mixture of sex, drugs, rock and roll, some skateboarding thrown in there for good measure, and just everything a young man wanted, or a young man in my case wanted. So today we're going to talk about what happened, how Vice became a from a zine to a media empire valued at over 5.7 billion at one time, to now teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. This is Vice. I always used to say that if Vice is doing news, then the world is completely fucked. Um, MTV approached us about doing a DVD series, and we decided to do travel for the first one. And a lot of the stories on the Vice Guide to Travel, we wrote about in the magazine over the years. I attribute Vice's early success is that they were, I think, the only media company to realize the future was online. And in 2007, they launched what was called VBS TV. Well, we're launching a, a broadband television network in January called VBS.TV. It's a Vice Broadcasting System. Right after we launched VBS, people started saying, North Korea, you know, why don't you go to North Korea? Why? Because nobody knows anything about North Korea. Shane Smith and Sarush Alvi had a series called A Vice Guide 2. And here, you saw guys doing, and when I say guys, I'm talking about the, the founders doing stuff like the Vice Guide to North Korea, the Vice Guide to Pakistan, the Vice Guide to Libya. They were doing shows that were really unseen at that time. They were showing us a side of the world that was really off limits. You know, if, if uh, the major media companies were covering something in Afghanistan, they were staying safe in a neighboring country or in an equivalent green zone where you have footage of Shane Smith and Sarush entering Pakistan, entering North Korea. It was just something you didn't see. And it came across as so raw and so authentic that it was very captivating. It's invincible power. The thing you realize in North Korea is you're not a tourist. You're on a tour. You come in, you're shown what you're shown, you're escorted out, you're escorted the whole time, you're never allowed on your own. You can't leave the hotel, which is on an island, until your guards come and get you. So I wasn't the only one noticing this great contact from Vice. Uh, it was growing and growing in popularity. More and more people begin to watch their online platform, watch all of their content, and with more people comes more advertising money. And with more advertising money comes investors. And that's exactly what Vice decided to do, was in order to expand, they wanted investors. So they sold off 5% of their company initially in 2013 to Rupert Murdoch. If you don't know, Rupert Murdoch is the same gentleman who runs Fox, and he runs a bunch of other media companies he is probably one of the top three media players in the U.S. Police have been amassing. Shortly after this huge injection of cash, Vice begins to expand. They open up offices in 35 different countries so they can cover more international news. overseas reporters. They build out a huge office in Brooklyn and they turn it into a basically what is the equivalent of a legacy TV station. They also have a partnership with the A&E Network and they have a cable show called Viceland on cable television. Vice Media becomes the first digital media company to launch its own cable TV channel. Viceland is a joint venture with A&E Network. After Rupert Murdoch invested in Vice, the company was worth a cool $1.4 billion. Things were sure looking good at Vice. Also worth mentioning at this time was Vice's target market. Vice was focused on young people in the 18 to 25 age bracket, maybe even up to 30. That'd be kind of the upper end. And the reason is twofold. One is they're a hard demographic to corral. And second, they have a, a combination of income and low overhead in their personal lives. So they have money to spend, which is exactly what advertisers want. If you like anime, you can pay 70 bucks an hour to go on a date with a girl dressed up like your favorite character. After Vice had built out all these overseas offices, 
They had built the production studio. They'd opened the London bar. They were canning their own beer. Open the last beer, uh, Pad Boy. Or, yeah, Pad Boy Vice. Things were Boy. looking great, right? Well, you know how things get better? What if Disney came along and wanted to give you a cool half a billion dollars? And that's just what they did. And not only Disney, another private equity firm came in and said, hey, how about another three, four hundred million on top of that? Vice said, sure, we'll take it. And that's exactly what happened. In 2016, Vice was literally printing cash. I also think you're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just laughed. So I guess <laughs> Look, we're doing well, which allows us the more money we make, the more content we can make, and that's what we want to do. We just live to make stuff. Also in 2016, brand deals were getting done with Intel, Adidas, and other big companies. Everything was looking great at Vice. And then it wasn't. At this time, Vice was peaking and worth an estimated $5.7 billion. But just as you know, everything good doesn't last forever and it was a quick fall for Vice. In 2017, they missed their estimated revenue targets by $100 million. Why did this happen with Vice? Why did they miss their numbers? And why did they begin the descent into the abyss? Well, I think the problem is fourfold. Okay, first, I'm gonna say they went too far, too deep. They expanded too quickly, and then they expanded into, a, into legacy media, which is what they were trying to avoid in the first place. They went open offices that weren't profitable. They built out this studio that gave them all the overhead that a legacy media station had without having the benefit of being on network television. Second thing I think that was a big pressure for Vice is if you've been on YouTube for any length of time, you remember the apocalypse. Well, it wasn't just related strictly to YouTube. All digital platforms in America and abroad in countries Vice was operating in were affected by advertisers not wanting to have their product advertised on graphic or controversial topics. And Vice, that's what they did. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, guns in Karachi, um, hitching across America, all their programming was kind of edgy, which is what got them their audience in the first place. But advertisers often do not have the stomach to be associated with controversy. The third reason I'll give for Vice's descent into the abyss would be their cable show Viceland. And they partnered on this with A&E, which means they didn't have creative control to begin with, or complete creative control. Second, to add to that, you also have to be compliant with more regulations because you're in the public sphere. Leading the creative vision and programming decisions for Viceland is Spike Jones. Yes, the Spike Jones, the Oscar award-winning writer and director for the film Her and other movies, including Where the Wild Things Are and Being John Malkovich. Whereas with digital, it's pretty much anything goes. You can do whatever you want. Third is you, you have to produce content 24-7 for a cable channel. You have to have something on your station all the time. All that production costs money. So you're going away from your core audience. You're taking on something that's going to cost you more time, more resources, and it's not something that your core audience will most likely really like. And it showed in the, it showed in the rating. And the last point I'll make, in 2017 there were a lot more digital players in the game. So advertising money was more fought after. You had Vox, you had Gawker, you had the legacy media companies, and at this point they had their online platforms up to snuff. So it wasn't just Vice Online, it was you know Vice and Vox and BuzzFeed and Gawker and whoever else. And you know, advertising dollars were just not what they were, you know, back in 2007. So what do you do when your income is decreasing, but you still have all these bills to pay? You do what you can to cut your, your not your what you need to make in a month, and that's exactly what Vice did. They closed underperforming offices overseas. They laid off staff. They laid off board members. They also went to financiers to look for more money to invest in Vice. And at this time, they were able to find it. They were still 
hope there that there was going to be a turnaround. What ended up happening going forward? Well, 2019 wasn't any better. And actually it was so bad. Remember all that money I told you about that Disney invested in Vice? <laughs> Gone. They wrote it off, said it was done. Imagine having that kind of money where you can just throw away almost half a billion dollars and just write it off. I don't know. I'm in the wrong line of work. Vice tried to find a buyer. So far, they haven't done so yet, and it looks like they're heading to bankruptcy. So they might actually end up going back to their roots. They might actually go to back to, uh, I don't know about their paper roots, because they killed their magazine in 2018 in the cost cutting, but they might go back to their digital roots and just have an online channel. But I'd like to point out in this whole thing that a lot of the other high-flying digital media companies that were even around five, six years ago have struggled gone out of business. The whole media industry as a whole is really financially struggling. So Vice is not alone or unique in this way, but it's interesting to see how far a company that came as introduced itself as the giant disruptor became what it hated. And then now it is maybe going back to its roots. So what will the future hold for Vice? Only time will tell. This is Spot. Thanks for watching.